are critically ill patients at risk during transport? And how could we ensure that these risks are mitigated so that finally the benefits are higher? Over the next 60 minutes, we will try to get a couple of answers to those questions with our panel of experts. So welcome to our Critical Care Live TV show from Paris. We are very proud to have a huge audience from all over the world. My name is Gerd Wirtz and it's my pleasure to moderate our scientific session today. Today's intra-hospital patient transport has become critical. It has evolved into a major activity with significant resource implications for healthcare providers. This frequent, complex and sensitive process requires adherence to high quality and safety standards. It is also a time-consuming task for healthcare professionals working in critical care areas, typically where nurses have to execute various tasks with high physical and psychological requirements. A study published in 2015 in Nursing Critical Care indicates that increased workload in ICU often keeps nurses from taking necessary work breaks, leading to higher levels of work stress. Patient transport often contributes to these higher stress levels for staff and may create operational inefficiencies. Seeking for ways to faster and safer patient transport is a major concern and our main topic for this session. So let me introduce our panel of European experts, starting with my right, Mona Ringel from Sweden. She is Associated Professor in Nursing at the Institute of Healthcare Sciences, Salgrenska Academy in Gothenburg University. And she is critical care nurse and senior advisor in research at the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, Kungelf Hospital in Sweden. Her main topics of research are patient safety and patient recovery from critical illness. Next to her is Erwin Lair from France. He is associated professor and head of the medical intensive care unit at Brest University Hospital and he is head of the Healthcare Simulation Center Brest University with more than 5,000 students per year. Furthermore, he is a member of the National Healthcare Research Institute and his specific fields are automation algorithms and biomedical devices development, biomedical devices evaluation and respiratory care. To my left is Thorsten Steinfeld from Germany. He is Associated Professor and Chairman uh, of the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine at the Diakonie Hospital in Schwäbisch Hall in Germany. His team does about 12,500 anesthesia procedures per year. His specialties are regional anesthesia, patient safety, anesthesia during elderly and post-operative delirium. So now we are ready to get started and you are all invited to take part in this discussion. So please write your anonymous questions using the chat tab on your screen and, you, and I will pass them to our speakers. We have a time after each presentation to address some of your questions and we will start a panel discussion with our experts at the end of their lectures. Mona, you are director of the PhD nursing program in 2017. You published a study in critical care medicine titled safety hazards during intra-hospital transport. We are keen to learn what was your motivation to initiate this study and, of course, what are the main learnings? I think that uh, we have to talk about the complications and or the hazards, the risk factors during intra-hospital transport. So you can actually divide them into two, two patient-related. So we know that the sick the patient is, a greater chance there is of problems during transport. And you can also divide them into system related, related to staff and organization, and related to equipment. This system related could actually be avoided. And we know that the critical care nurses internationally constitute the basic of the transport team. So together with the physician and other health care professionals, they try to do the same care of the patient like in the ICU. 
although we, we don't know that much of their experience during the intra-hospital transports, actually. So we did this study. We had this study that we published in 2015, and it's a questionnaire study to critical care nurses in two Swedish ICUs in Sweden. And there were 86 critical care nurses who answered. And as you can see here, they actually said that they received intra-hospital training, but only 52% did that. 65% said that they had guidelines for the intra-hospital transport, so there can be improvement here. And also it's important to say that more than half of the intra-hospital transport in Sweden is performed by the critical care nurse without a physician. So when we know this, we also ask the um, critical care nurses of, say, some comments about the transport. And we analyzed it in five categories. And you can see the, the one who is, say, well-functioning. And there were, were very few of them who said it was well-functioning. Most of them said it makes demands and it's time-consuming. A lot of critical care nurses also said it's a moment of stress and it's a burden of work for staff remaining in the ICU. And this is also uh, taking care of the other patients. It's come to a halt as well. So this is what we see about the stress factors. The next slide is about what's actually happened during the intra-hospital transport. So we, uh, further on, we did the, this observational study where the doctoral student of my, Lena Bergman, was the one who was performing this, and she did three months of observational study in two ICUs in Sweden. We have 51 transports, and uh, you can see that there are sort of, the patients are very sick. 80% of them were on mechanical ventilation. 51% had vasopressor support, and um, Actually, most of the transport were performed without a physician, so going with them. <clears throat> and uh, if we go to this, we can see that there is 365 hazards during this intra-hospital transport. So it's in average seven hazards in every transport. And we have used a patient safety model to analyze these hazards. And you can see the five different uh, sort of hazards group here. And the biggest group is, with one third, is tools and technologies. And tools and technologies is poor usability or function transport equipment. And it's equipment error. And that's the big group. The other group is tasks hazards, and that is 83 of the hazards. And here you can see interruptions and disturbance, for example, moving the patient from um, the bed to the um, exam table we have here. And the third big group is team hazards. And here you have unclear team roles and uh, the lack of situation awareness and communications problem. That's a big part as well, you can see here. So we, we were analyzed these 365 <laughs> hazards and see how many of those were actually one adverse event. And there was only 1% of them who was uh, sort of uh, the, the patient who could sort of getting harmed. It could be an um, extubation, for example, 1%. And in 21%, it was resulting in near misses, like the disconnecting of the tubes could be. But uh, due to the rapid response from the staff, it could actually, nothing was happening. You can also see that there were a lot of hazards who was increasing the risk of harms in 57%, actually. So, I, we, we were thinking, what could we do to minimize the hazards? And one solution could be for a timeout. So a timeout is something that you do in the theater 
before starting the surgery. And we could think that this could be something we could do before the transport as well. So we have made a movie, and this is a small part of it, who is showing the timeout before the inter-hospital transport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Johan and Lena, let's go through the timeout and make sure that we're ready for transport. This is Mr. Smith, born in 1945. Mr. Smith will undergo a CT scan today to check his current condition. We will be leaving the ICU, taking the elevator to radiology to lab one on the first level of the hospital. I'm Gita, the critical care nurse responsible for the patient and team leader of this transport. I have a phone with me so we can call the intensivist if we have any questions or concerns. Hmm. And I'm Joan, the uh, critical care nurse that will assist Gita and, um, and, um, in this tra transport and I will be responsible for the emergency bag and make sure that the lines are functioning. Perfect. My name is Lina. I'm the assistant nurse. I will help out during the transport and I know the way to the CT. Let's go through the checklist. Any questions? No. no. Then we're ready to go. So this is one example of the, uh, the uh, timeout, actually, that you could see. And uh, maybe we could implement them in further research. So. Mm. But there are more things that we can do, as you can see here now. Uh, we can implement strategies to overcome stress during inter-hospital transport for all the staff, actually. I think it's necessary. And finally, we want to develop transport equipment in collaboration with end users. So it's important to have a really safe transport for our, mm. all our patients. Mm. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mona, mm. for this uh, insights into the daily work of a critical nurse. Uh, we saw this impressive film and there was mentioned a checklist. Mm. So of what does this checklist consist? What is uh, the meaning of this checklist? Yeah. So the checklist is consist <coughs> that what sort of equipment do you need? What sort of things do you take with you? Are there enough oxygen? Are there enough battery? Do we have all the medication with us? A phone, for example, to call somebody? Mm -hmm. So there could be a different checklist for um, different hospitals. But the mm -hmm. timeout is sort of both saying where you are going, with whom you are going, and the patient, and the checklist. Mm -hmm. And then it's focus, now we are going. Everything is okay. Mm -hmm. Are checklists already existing, uh, for example, in your clinic? Yes, of course. For example, if patients get in the operational theater, um, there has always be always be used the checklist before the patient can uh, enter the operation theater room. Mm. Mm. For example, regarding um, all um, if if everything is completed, laboratory data and all these things. And um, yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And there was a, a leader, a team leader announced in that film. Yeah. So who should be the team leader in real life situations uh, in intra-hospital transport? Mm. I think that there could be sort of uh, different professionals who could be the team leader. I think the critical care nurse is a really good team leader because <coughs> the nurse is one who's taking care of the whole transport. So I prefer the, the, the critical care nurse as a team mm -hmm. leader. The important thing is that the team leader is, is everybody know who is the team leader during the whole transport. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's it. So every one of the others agree? A little bit disagree because, um, for example, you have shown that um, in, in, in Sweden most transport are um, done by nurses without physicians and um, I think this is uh, really different, especially in my hospital and I think in the majority of hospitals in Germany, that mostly if patients are instable or ventilated, um, they have been always be accompanied by a physician as well. So you have one physician and one nurse. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we have to talk about the responsibility. Mm, Who is the leader of that transport yes. team? That's yes, interesting. Of course. And you can be the team leader of the transport, but you're not responsible for the medicine, for example. Yeah. So, so it's, Maybe, yes. I think it should be one of those people, but it could, could be actually the, the, the physician, but it could also be the nurse yeah. so, of the Especially transport. Especially if it's a junior physician, yeah. probably the critical care nurse yeah. will be a better leader mm. than the junior. It could mm. be, yeah. 
I think the experience we all have <coughs> is maybe that, that nurses are more familiar with the technical things of the monitoring yeah. Yeah. instead of the physicians, mm. especially young, younger residents and physicians are mm. not that familiar. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to sort of clear out who is the mm -hmm. team leader mm -hmm. for this transport. Mm -hmm. yeah. So your study classified five different categories of hazard and the poor usability of transport equipment is one of the main hazards. And that leads us directly to our next topic. Erwan, you are an intensivist, but you are also a human factor and usability expert. You will give us a valuable insight how human factor engineering can help to improve intra-hospital transport. But the first question of all is, what is human factor engineering? So thanks a lot, Gerd. So that may be a tricky question for a physician, but I'm just waiting for the slide. In fact, I will try to convince you that human factor engineering is very important from a physician point of view, from a clinician point of view, and that it may impact on the usability of the <coughs> di different devices that we are using in our unit. Um, we, we can define human factor engineering also as ergonomics evaluation. It clearly refers to the way the machines, the devices are designed and aiming always to improve either the safety for the patients from the patient's point of view, but also for the comfort point of view of the clinician. And I'm totally convinced that this aim uh, produces uh, an enhancement of the productiveness. Uh, the, the, qu the question is, is it really important from a healthcare point of view? If you just look at the inside an airplane, uh, you, you are totally convinced that the right, the good button must be at the right place. That's quite very simple to understand. That will lead to less error and that will increase the productiveness of the pilot. But the question is, is it exactly the same in the healthcare environment? And if you just look at these three different images, either from a biomedical device point of view, from an emergency department process of care, but also for, from the ICU environment. You see a lot of different biomedical devices. I'm totally convinced that that's no more different than the, the, the pilot in, in an airplane. So we should focus on human factor engineering in the healthcare also. So that's the reason why we try to develop a model uh, and we published it two years ago in Annals of Intensive Care. And considering that to evaluate efficacy, we should not on only focus on the technical point of view, but have a look on the four different dimensions, which are the efficiency. The efficiency, of course, you, if you get a biomedical device, it needs to work well, it needs to provide the physician what they want, but that's not the, their sole purpose. We should also evaluate their ease of use, and from our point of view, the best way to evaluate the ease of use is to test it on naive subject. We should also evaluate the tolerance to error is there enough alarm, something that will increase the ease of use for the subject? And of course, we should also focus on the engagement. Are the clinicians that are using the biomedical devices confident to what they are doing and how they are using the device? And just considering these four dimensions, we just perform an evaluation of four of several different ICU ventilators. On the, the, the left part of the, the slide, you see a spotted chart of the NASA telex. The NASA telex is a way to evaluate the mental workload, which is the amount of uh, mental effort that is required to, to perform a different task. Uh, our reference was the orange chart, the AVEA, which was a, a, an ancient uh, ventilator that we were using for more than 10 years. It was supposed to, to provide us a very small chart, a small area, which was exactly what we observed. And with the AVEA, just because we are quite experienced with that, we have a huge task completion rate 
less error and a, a good completion rate. If you just look at the global mental workload that was required to, per, to use the V680, which was a prototype ventilator, the, the spider shot is quite huge. So physicians that were using it required a huge amount of work just to understand what they were doing. And in fact, we also observed with this increased mental workload, a decrease in the task completion rate. So there are quite, there's quite a good correlation between the mental workload that is required to do, use a device and the way we <coughs> will finally do the task. And if you just have a look on the, on, on the last part of the shot, the RX60 from GE, you can see that the area was quite small, just like the our old experienced uh, ventilator, and this was also correlated to a good task completion rate. So I, we are totally convinced that the, the way physicians think, the, the, the amount of work that they need to perform the, uh, is quite correlated to this complexion rate. So how are we doing that in, in our simulation lab? We are using our usability lab. All the scenarios that are tested are quite standardized. We're recording everything, the audio, also the, the video. Here you can see a, a small picture from the control room. Uh, everything on the video is tagged so we can clearly define and find the, the determinants of what we are looking at. We just performed for GEL Scare last year a study on two different transport monitors just trying to, to compare the two devices and to clearly evaluate the determinants of failure. So you can see on the slide the, the, the way the scenario and the, and the environment were standardized and just the tagging of the video and the result of there, once again, using the NASA telex. On the left part, you can see the orange chart represent the comparator. You can see that the global mental workload that was required to use this device was quite huge. And you can see that this increased mental workload was also related to some failure. You can see on the movie on the right slide that the, the monitor suddenly fall. The nurses was trying to, to understand how it could fit on the docking system. She did not perform well and the, the monitor fall and it break. So we are totally convinced once again that an increased mental workload as compared to, to the CareScape one, which is in blue, uh, is related to some part of error. With the, the blue devices, we observe nine errors on the global testings, while with the orange devices, we observed more than 23 errors. So that was a statistically significant difference. So once again, a good correlation between the amount of work required to perform the task and the real error, at finally. And it could also be related to some part of productive productiveness. And if we just were looking at the global time for a transport scenario, in fact, we observed with the, the devices that had the lowest mental, that required the lowest mental workload, we observed a decrease of approximately 25% of the global total time. I'm not sure that it, this has any clinical significance, but at least from an operating room point of view, we are able to, to run it much more rapidly. So this may be of some importance in terms of the hospital administration. So just some three, four, three, four simple take home messages. From my point of view, human factor engineering may clearly improve improve care. It may help us to, to decrease the error of the failure rate and, and so on. It may also be a very significant determinant of improved productiveness. Thank you very much, Robert, for this uh, impressive insight into engineering and uh, human factor engineering. Um, I received already, again, questions from the audience. And one is, these subjects um, <clears throat> which are recorded during your evaluations, they know that uh, they are observed. So what about the Hawthorne effect in this case? Uh, 
That, that, that's quite clear and that's <coughs> known for, for, for more than 50 years that when subjects are looked at, they do perform better. So that's the reason why in our usability lab, when we are doing some usability evaluation, we are always trying to test the system on naive subject. Just because the naive subject are coming from no experience at all, so they can only improve, nothing more than that. And we are looking then backwards and, and see if the, their improvement uh, is still the same. While with experienced user, it's much difficult to see their improvement and to see if this improvement stays upon time. Mm. And can you explain how human factors improve the productiveness? Just if we, we go back on the airplane point of view, if the button is at, at the right time, it takes less time to perform it. If in the ICU you need to, to understand where I should plug it on or should plug my device off, that takes time. Mm -hmm. And times plus time plus time, that may increase the global time of care. Mm -hmm. Had the other two speakers, have you felt human engineering uh, in your daily life already? Yes, I think oft, more often I think uh, with products that, <coughs> that uh, a machine is not really well designed for our, mm -hmm. for our requirements. But I have one question to Erwan. Erwan, mm -hmm. please explain more specifically how did they um, decrease the transport time with more than about 20%. That's really <coughs> a That's huge the, effect. The, there are different timings during a process. Uh, of course, plugging it on, just plugging the cable, docking and docking. So okay. time plus time plus time, you gain time at each time. So at the final recording, that may be significant. So you mean the connection yeah. and disconnection of plus cables? Plus the error. Each error will increase the global time. Okay. And sometimes, Ergonomics, some, some industrial just provide us a very fancy, very fancy biomedical device. You can just switch from a screen to the other. And sometimes it's too fancy and too complicated. Yes. Mm. Mm. And that increased time also. Okay. These many hazards which were shown in your study, <clears throat> they are going back to uh, sometimes to back of uh, lack of uh, human factor engineering? What do you think? I can see that, yes. And I can also see that, for example, you have different alarms and you have to know which alarms mm -hmm. is, is sort of alarming me at the moment. And you have to be multitasking, doing a lot of things at the same time. And you have to have focus on the patient and something's happened and, and people are talking to you. So it's very important that it's simple, mm -hmm. really. And uh, on sort of, if, if I could decide, I think we should have everything on a screen, actually, mm -hmm. so you can see what's happening, mm -hmm. which alarm is alarming, for example. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think now we have a better understanding of human factor engineering and usability evaluation. And now let's switch to daily practice. Thorsten, you are a recognized expert about anesthesiology, and you have to execute patient transport in your daily work, maintaining a high level of safety and a high level of quality care. Uh, so what are your thoughts about monitoring patients during transport after surgery? And for, uh, after all, which solutions did you implement in your unit? Thank you, Gerd, for that nice uh, presentation. Yes, um, we were talking about intensive care medicine and now we have to talk about the operation theater and what happens there with patient transport and of course all patients have to be transported in the operation theater first um, in the operation area and then after induction from the induction maybe in the operation room itself and after the operation uh, the way from the operation room to the PACU or recovery room and um, sometimes even from the recovery room to the intensive care unit. So there are many crucial um, points where something could happen where transport is um, absolutely required. And so we heard um, of Erwan that uh, the, the very important aspect is connecting cables, disconnecting cables. And so you need a lot of 
um, technique and so this is really um, resource intensive and time consuming. And um, the other thing is that we have a lot of risks. What could happen after induction of an anesthesia? That patient is not able to breathe itself. And so everything has to work. How we ventilate and of course we have to know more about the monitoring. What happens in the patient? And so there are some key things they have to be considered. So what's about the staff, the working process, the technology surrounding the staff and the working process, the mobility, how can we, um, how can we provide mobility of monitoring and uh, mobility of the patient and at the end of the day we have to ask or to talk about innovation. And so I want to say some things about the staff and the processes. All processes have to be absolutely re reliable so that everybody knows what he has to do in the workflow and who is who plays which role and is responsible with uh, during the processes and all these processes have to be um, written down like a standard operating procedure this is very important that everybody knows what to do during the process and so we have to talk about the technology this is really mandatory so the technology has to be very stable and function because um, everything we are doing, movement, transporting patients in the operation area, um, that needs robustness of the whole system, robustness of the technology. And um, this technology has to be well adapted to our workflow. And if it's good adapted, you will have a nice acceptance uh, by the staff um, because maybe it's very easy to use. And um, so, the other thing is, are uh, these devices are really mobile, and uh, this is this is a problem because our um, our former um, monitoring systems had not been directly mobile. So you disconnect after induction. You dis after induction, you disconnect the patient, and you go in the operation room, or after the operation, you have to move to the recovery room. That's a problem. So at the end of the day, you need a standardized equipment. So if you change the location in the operation room, it is important that everywhere we have the same technology and everywhere we use the same cables. This is very important. So mobility, um, this is a very important aspect. We have two crucial phases. One phase is after the induction and the next phase is after the operation on the way to the recovery room. And the way from the operation room to the recovery room. I think it's the longest and it takes something about 5 to 15 minutes and in this time period a lot of things can happen and um, so um, we have to mobi mobilize the patient from the operation table in the bed and all these things and in normal hospitals the patient get always disconnected and um, during this connect this in this in this uh, moment of disconnection um, there could be adverse events we know that all because of um, for example problems with relaxants with opioids with um, with our hypnotic drugs and um, of course volatile gases and um, so we have to know is there an adverse event and for example in my former um, department a study group wanted to know are we able um, to estimate the oxygen saturation and so they ask in, in 1000 cases um, physicians and nurses what do they think how high is the oxygen saturation and um, in 20 percent they overestimated the saturation they um, they estimated something like 95 to 98 percent but uh, for real um, the situation was something under 90 percent and that is really um, an adverse event that patients are hyp um, hypo um, ox um, they're, they're, they're hypoxic and nobody um, is recognizing that and so after that study we changed our um, our behavior that we used more oxygen for the transport from the operation theater to, to the recovery room and that we use pulse oximetry. This is a very easy solution. So for looking in the future, what is important regarding innovation? I think it is very important that we have one connection to the patient at the beginning and then the patient gets connected to the monitoring system until he's 
at the end of the recovery room. So even in the recovery room, it's always the same connection. We do not disconnect the patient and um, then it is important that the ergonomical situation with the monitoring is okay. So we have more or less a comfortable small monitor, but with all parameters, not only pulse oximetry, uh, maybe ECG and hemodynamic um, parameters like blood pressure and um, respiratory parameters. And this should be integrated in the whole system and the environment. And maybe for the future, the system should be open for new parameters we, which are important for transportation. So the best practice example is that we connected during the induction, that we moved to the OR, OR, always with the same system, to the recovery room, always during the transport, we are able to look and on all parameters which have to be visible. So what is the outcome? The outcome, if we have really um, a continuous monitoring should be an increased staff satisfaction, I'm sure, because um, the, um, all the processes are easier. You do not have to disconnect the patient and have to connect the patients. You have always visibility of adverse events, and maybe we can avoid hypoxemia, and we identify hypoxemia very, very early, and of course we apply oxygen as it is mandatory, um, important, and required for the patient. So my take home message is um, phases between um, the induction and OR and OR and recovery room are critical. And these critical incidences which could happen in that phases are underestimated. And so continuous monitoring is mandatory important. And for looking in the future, we need a monitoring which is connected directly at the beginning of the whole procedure of operation to the patient and um, so will be connected during the entire process until the patient is finished with the recovery phase. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Thorsten. Uh, I've got a question directly from, from the audience concerning the process. Uh, how was it to implement this continuous monitoring in a, in a healthcare unit like yours? I think the first step is very easy. If you just start with uh, continuous pulse oximetry, mm -hmm. they are cheap, they are small, the patient can wear it the whole time, that, this would really help. And um, if you have an adverse event like hypoxemia, you will identify it directly, you can apply oxygen. This is <coughs> the first step. But the next step should be um, that we um, Additionally, additionally monitor, for example, ECG, because uh, ECG is, of course, the gold standard for monitoring. It's even implemented in ASA recommendations. And so we should always, always monitor ECG and blood pressure as well and respiratory data. Mm -hmm. So there's a step for a future that, um, yes, our monitoring companies adapt to that requirement. Mm -hmm. But the first step is pulse oximetry and oxygen. Mm -hmm. What are your experiences with uh, implementing of these continuous monitoring in clinics? I think that if you have good devices, actually, and if you have good guidelines what to do, it's, it's easy, actually, to implement it because from a nursing point of view, you want to have safe uh, devices and you want to have good, when you look at your patient, you want to see all these figures and see the patient say it's okay. So um, I think that if you have the good thing, actually, you can uh, do it very well. Mm -hmm. So it's not, not a problem, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh. And if I move to that study we applied some years ago mm. and where we all um, were surprised that 20% of the patients were underestimated uh, regarding oxygenation, mm. um, afterwards everybody was thinking more about this topic of oxygenation mm. and the people um, were not long thinking if they take the, oxygena ox the oxygen bottle or not, they took it. Mm. And yeah. that was the right decision and yeah. very easy. You really want your patient to, to have good care. Yes, actually, yes. Absolutely. and nurses and physicians yeah, yeah. are happy. You don't want anything to happen during mm -hmm. that transport. That's it. Mm. D did you recognize something significant uh, with respect to patient safety in your department? 
I think the avoidance of, of hypoxemia is always a patient safety factor. Mm -hmm. That's the key safety factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you to everybody of you for this bulk of information we got from your lectures. And uh, now we have time left for a panel discussions and uh, we have uh, plenty of questions from the audience outside. And um, let's try to answer some of these questions before our time is running away. Um, Mona, there was a lot of questions around uh, the daily life of nurses. They have to execute a lot of uh, very difficult tasks and, uh, and they, are, uh, they are used to stress. But why is patient transport so, uh, transport so extraordinarily stressful for nurses? So I think that it's stressful for nurses because you are out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. because you're out of ICU. In ICU you have a lot of colleagues that could actually help you if you sort of need help and then you have to go out for a transport and uh, there is not that many people there who could help you and all the devices not working in the right way and also all when you are transporting a patient in a bed you you actually have to find your way and you also have to have all these bumps everywhere mm -hmm. so things can actually happen so a lot of nurses I've, I've talked to and their studies, our studies say now that they think it's uh, really risk taking. But mm -hmm. at the same time, they also think that they can manage it. They mm -hmm. can manage the, not the risks, but they can do things that sort of nothing actually happens to mm -hmm. the patients. So, mm -hmm. mm. so Torsten, in your clinic, how do you handle this stress of nurses? Uh, are there techniques to lower them, to give them more security, uh, to uh, f uh, make them feel more comfortable? I think it is very important what Mona says. You're out of your comfort zone if you leave the intensive care unit. For example, if you need some drugs or whatever else, you do not know where to search for your drugs. And so it is very important to be well prepared to have the right drugs with you. And um, yes, and the other thing is we heard so much about problems with technical problems with monitoring mm -hmm. and if this would work, this would definitely decrease stress, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And if this would be very comfortable, it would be a, a nice factor. Mm -hmm. On the other thing, there are so many things we cannot guide in that aspect. For example, if you are in an elevator, whatever else, and something happens, mm -hmm. you are alone. You mm -hmm. are alone and you have to to manage that problem. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why simulation lab could be of interest. Just doing, like, like in the operating room, doing some crisis resource management during transport, mm -hmm. training and training the nurses to face situations that are outside that comfort zone. And in the simulation lab, we can do that without any arm for the patients and just doing something that are un Un, un, unusual mm -hmm. that may help to make the, the team more confident with the different authors that they may face. Mm -hmm. And I think adverse events with intensive care medicine <coughs> patients are uh, much more um, more difficult compared to patient uh, to, to adverse events in the operation theater during the transport from the operation to the recovery room because there are so many people. So if there is something somebody would call emergency and, and 15 persons will come and will help you. A lot of anesthesiologists and, and high uh, qualified nurses. And on the way to the CT scan or MRI, you're really alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's one more thing, you were talking about the elevator, for example. So in Sorgenska Hospital, they have rebuilt the elevator there. So it's, they made them bigger. And if, if the elevator stops or anything like that, it's it taking, you, can, you have oxygen there, you have a phone there, and you have suctioning mm -hmm. and everything. And that's also a good example of the environmental, what you can do for having more safe transports. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these standards are different all over Europe? I think so. 
yeah. for example, sure. in, in, in mm. that hospitals I know from Germany, I have never seen that yet. You have the possibility of, of uh, applying, of, of application of, of oxygen or... Mm. Uh, but if you have a look at, at the, uh, you have the overview of a lot of many biomedical devices which are on the market. What do you think? Are most of them taking into account the, the human factor engineering and the usability? I, I'm not sure of that. Uh, manufacturers and industrial are quite aware uh, that they should focus on the user experience, but by For years, they have been mainly focusing on, from an engineering point of view, doing the most fancy things, the most fancy biomedical device that we could provide. Just making some, there are some ventilators that just look like an iPhone. You can switch from a screen to another screen. So that was very fancy. They just tried to improve the user experience, but in some time, they increased the difficulty to use these devices. Some industrial, I'm totally convinced, are <coughs> focused on the most important things. And we have tested some ventilators, we have tested some transport monitors that are clearly dedicated to, to the real factor that may improve the, the care. But some need to make some progress, certainly. I would like to add something. I think, for example, regarding technology, intensive care medicine, regarding respirators, um, that is very hard work, I think, because there are so many different kinds of ventilation and uh, newer ventilators, they have all that modi, modi inside in the program and it is very, very difficult at the beginning for the nurses um, to cope with it because um, you do not have that overview you need. Mm. And I think one way of um, working more effectively with, with that new um, technology could be that you, you'd reduce everything to that um, requirements in that specific uh, department. During the that past helps. two years, we have to buy more than 40 ICU ventilators for, for our hospital. We just tested all the technological problems, but all the ventilators were, were quite equal in terms of technology, some few minor differences in ventilatory mode. But the real differentiating criteria was ergonomics. And the devices that we bought was only based, the, the, our choice was only based on ergonomics. I want to make a comment about this because we could also see that in our observational study that a lot of sort of, you know, the cords, they were too short. So when you move the patient from the bed to the examination table, the cords, they were to sort of stretch out all the time. So. They're done for the patient in the ICU and not to move the patients for a distance, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So, so I was really shocked uh, hearing about your study that uh, uh, during a patient transport, in uh, average, seven uh, hazards uh, occur. Uh, and most of them are related to tools and technology. Do you, do you have any explanation for that? No, I, I think more of that the tools and technologies is actually the devices that we use so much. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> what should I say? They are, they are not, um, we don't use them normally to go to transport. It is sort of, I think that you have to do very much improvement in mm -hmm. the tools and technologies for a transport because Patients are more transported today as well, and the sick patients are more transported. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just think that the tools and technologies, every research actually say that those are the, the key thing when uh, things happen, hazards and that sort of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about innovation? Uh, oh, um, it's, it's, do we have a, a quick development of innovation? from the technical point of view, or uh, is it slow at the moment? The, the problem of innovation is always certification. There are different ways to, 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 think, to think this point. Of course, certification slows the process of implementing um, innovation. 
And the other part of the problem is that innovation sometimes is not mandatory. As you said, we already know what is really important. Oxygenation, ECG tracing, blood pressure at least. Only three very simple problems while, while transporting a patient. We also need a good ventilator. So I'm not sure we need very fancy ventilatory mode. We just may focus on these very simple points. Probably, but I have a huge conflict of interest just because I'm working on innovation. Automation, uh, automation of the oxygen process is maybe important from my point of view. What is from your point of view the most convincing advantage of continuous monitoring, Thorsten? Yes, the convincing adv um, advantage would be that um, you would really save time by just connecting once at the beginning and disconnecting really at the end. And um, so that would, time, would be time saving. It would be nice um, for all the staff which are working with it. And um, it could be relatively easy because you just take one mobile monitoring and the cables and you connect them to the patient. Then this system accompanies the patient um, until to the recovery room, until the anesthesiologist gives the patient to the recovery room, and then he gets a new monitor with him and cables for the next patient. And so you have a circling of, of monitoring systems and cables, and, and it would work. Mm. It's easy. Mm. But we are in 2019, and um, yes, in most hospitals, we are always working with connecting and disconnecting. So if this is standardized. Uh, what do you think? Is a physician needed on every patient transport? I think you, you talked about this yeah. topic. Yeah. So if, if I begin with that, I yeah. could say that if you have a trained critical care nurse who is experienced, and if you have two critical care nurses actually, or three on a transport, I can see that is safe enough, actually. <coughs> you, you need to have a telephone with you so you can actually talk with a physician. But if you, if you say that you are in, in a room with a critical care patient, the physician is not in the room the whole time because you, you, you uh, phone him or her and, and ask for advice or ordination and that sort of things. And you can actually do that on, on the transport as well. I can see that. And every critical care nurse can actually uh, keep the patient in life it's, until the physician is there. But you, of course, the physician must be aware of that there is a transport ongoing, yeah. Yes, I agree. And I believe that the nurses in, in, in Sweden are very, very highly um, qualified. But I do not know how is the forensic situation. Because, for example, in, in Germany and in my department, if a patient is instable or if a patient is connected to a ventilator, it's mandatory that a physician has to accompany the patient for a transport. That's, uh, that's something like a rule. And um, yes, maybe we have different requirements in our country or possible. The problem is that the nurse to patient ratio is quite different, at least in France from Sweden. We only have one ICU nurse for four patients. Okay. Even if they are ventilated and they're renal, renal replacement, though, it's quite difficult to mm. get two nurses for transport, though we get a junior resident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I will be much more confident with two cl mm. critical care, experienced critical care mm. nurse, mm. Since, certainly. So in Sweden, we have the ratio one to two patients, and uh, sometimes one to one depends on, but it's, it's <coughs> also that could be a nurse, a critical care nurse, who is sort of free out in the corridor and could go with the other nurse. So, and it depends on the patient. If, if the patient is unstable, actually, of course, the physicians should go with. But not on every transport, I don't think so, really. So we have to define unstable patient. Unstable <laughs> <laughs> patient, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So mm. this is a topic for further discussions, I yeah. think. Um, we have time for one other question and I got a, an interesting one from the audience uh, and that uh, is uh, related to your study again. 
uh, we had this high amount of hazards on the one hand, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, a very low rate of adverse, of serious adverse events. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how did that come? So hazards is something, it's, it's like a risk factor. Mm -hmm. So we, we were actually looking for risk factors that something very bad could happen. But it didn't happen because of the, the staff were on their toes all the time and you are so focused when you are on the transport and, and you are looking at everything. You have one patient, not four, for example, you have one patient. And because of that, I think that there are just a few adverse events and more of the risk factors. So does that make sense for mm -hmm. you, actually? Yes. So they act before anything happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There have been several evaluations of this problem, which is considered that the reason model, which is also a, uh, used in the airplane industry. Uh, an adverse event is rarely due to one other. It's a succession, mm. multiple events that will go and make the adverse uh, events finally. Yes. And not one single other. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. <coughs> Yes, time is running so fast and we are coming to the end of a very fruitful scientific session. Uh, there are a lot of questions which we couldn't answer during our discussion now. And I have the promise of all uh, the speakers that we put together a document with all answered questions and we will share that with you. And uh, so let me follow in your lectures and the panel discussions. Um, I did extract some take-home messages of all these uh, lectures and I would like to share these take-home messages with you and uh, with our audience. Um, and it's to ensure a safer and a more efficient patient transport, we need several things. First of all, we need continuous staff education and training and continuous uh, monitoring during transport as a gold standard and implementing and following standards and guidelines and time out is a very good example for that. Thank you very much. We hope that our today's scientific show will help to drive changes in healthcare organization to improve patient outcomes. You are very welcome to share today's key insights and I would like to thank our experts Mona Ringdel from Sweden uh, Erwin Lehr from France and Thorsten Steinfeld from Germany for their time and for their inspiring lectures and of course the audience all over the world for their interest and their contribution to our panel discussion. Last but not least, let me also thank GE Healthcare as the sponsor who made this educational session possible. So we wish you a very nice evening from Paris and we hope to see you soon again with another live TV show. Uh, so take care, goodbye.